Thank you, and, and thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to talk. And it would be an, an even greater pleasure to be at Siam and, and actually uh, do the talk in the nice room. But uh, well, maybe maybe next time. All right. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, a new approach to what is called averaging lemma that that we. Um, uh, that, that we introduced uh, um, a year ago uh, with my um, former student now, uh, Sini Lin and Anetan Tanmo. And as uh, you've given me a lot of time to go over it, right, I, I want to do that reasonably slowly and, and explain a little bit what, uh, what this is about. Um, so this is roughly the, the, the plan. Uh, today I'll, I'll start with uh, a broad introduction to averaging lemma, which is not going to be super detailed. I, I could actually spend uh, one hour just on point one. Uh, there is now huge literature on that on that question, um, but I, I felt better to to would better to, to keep most of the time to actually explain what, what we are doing new. Um, so I will go through point one and point two uh, reasonably fast. So I, I apologize for all the people that I will not quote or not quote well enough, not as much as, as they would deserve. Uh, but so one and two are going to be one very broad introduction and, and two uh, a slightly more detailed example of, of one of the application, uh, one of the big applications of, of, of averaging lemma. And, and then what I want to do today is to give you the, the, the main basic idea of the method, uh, which is actually very simple, and that's, uh, that's one, big, uh, one big advantage of it. Um, and then the rest of the week will go more into the, the um, well, more complex settings with, uh, where we have applied that. Uh, so the basic, uh, the basic case with no derivative on the right-hand side, as you will see today, uh, extremely simple. Um, what I will talk then about is, is uh, cases with derivatives in LT spaces which requires uh, combining this with uh, something which looks a lot like uh, um, the renormalization technique that was introduced by Di and Lyons. Um, and I'll also talk about the case of uh, specially inhomogeneous uh, settings, uh, meaning when the velocity field also depends on the position. And uh, my last point will be uh, another example of, of method that derives from, from, uh, from this general idea of commutator uh, that, will, uh, that I will show you that it can be used to uh, derive mean field limits or some long time behavior of, of less of Poisson type of, of equation. So um, let's, uh, let's jump right in. What, what is this about? So averaging lemma applies to kinetic equations. and typically to kinetic equations of, of that form. And in general, here you have a right-hand side that can include derivatives in x, derivatives in v, and, and things like that. So, something 
thing of this type. Right, so kinetic equation, so you're looking for a solution in phase space so that depends on position and velocity. Um, so this, this is sort of a very general form and, and it will include uh, both mean field models like Lazar Poisson, right? And in that case, uh, G, Field. Sorry. field models, right? Uh, what we have is that everything here, uh, this minus Laplacian X, theta, Laplacian P, right, is one derivative in V of a nonlinear function of f because you have a convolution with some kernel k. Okay. And of course, big example and Kernel uh, taken on F. Uh, classical example is the Boltzmann equation. Of course, I'm not going to to spend uh, ten minutes to to um, to write down what the kernel of the of the Boltzmann equation is, but. Um, I mean, those of you would uh, remember, otherwise you have the wrong. This is, this is again a quadratic, um, quadratic expression. The third example that I'll go a little bit more into the details uh, after that is. Uh, the case of kinetic formulation. And it can be, for example, derivative in the um, and you don't know what is M, it actually corresponds to a Lagrange multiplier to, to something else, uh, to some constants, as I will. Okay. Uh, the, the type of model that, that I have in mind. Okay. Um, and uh, the action is a bit slow on my side. Do you see my screen when I'm moving it? Actually, we have a, a problem with the sound as well, but we can see the slides. You can see the slide, okay. So, Q collision kernel, kinetic formulation, right-hand side. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to move them too much. I was trying to go up and down, and I, I at least on my screen, it was not moving so much, so... Excuse me, maybe for your webcam, you have to choose a low quality. Uh, in B blue button or? Yeah, in, uh, no, uh, yes, you have to, to disconnect your webcam. Yes. To connect and choose the uh, low quality in okay. the. Okay, I'm di disconnecting. Uh, 
OK. Is, is that better? Can you hear me better? Yeah, I, I, now it's, it's good. OK. Well, I, I, I hope we'll be OK <laughs> after that. Let's try. All right. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, kinetic equation, right, uh, first order transport equation, so, right, there cannot be any regularizing effect per se. This is very obvious in, in the case of the uh, of the model, right? Uh, because assuming that everything is reasonably smooth, you can use the method of characteristics, and uh, you get that you know f of t is equal to uh, summation of x. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter what the transformation is, it can be very smooth as well. Uh, you're not going to have more regularity on F than you had on F0, obviously. Uh, now, for our type of model, it might be a little bit less clear, but again, at least in that, uh, in that case, it's completely obvious that, that it's not possible to have any kind of regularization like a heat equation. Uh, but you still have some sort of gain of regularity if you look at it in the right sense. And this the, the big thing behind averaging lemma um, So the way to look at it is to take averages in the five that is smooth, maybe even compactly supported and everything, right? I'm looking at the integral of T. This has some gain of regularity in some sense. Now, this was uh, observed uh, something like 35 years ago already. And the, the, the big first result in, in, in that regard was a uh, paper you know, very, very uh, Lyon uh, And essentially studied the L2 case, uh, which I'm going to give you a, a very here when the, the dependence and the velocity is, is very, uh, very simple as well. And in that case, F is L2. Local, at least, right? Especially locally in time, you don't 
has anything for t tends to infinity, right? So if both of those things are in L2, then you get half a derivative of in L2 again. And it remains Um, so this is where we're spending 30 seconds on the um, to understand correctly what is going on here. Okay. So what happens is that, that the trajectories, if you ignore G, are just lines, right? Uh, but they are not parallel to the um, they, they, they mix x and v. And so when you integrate in v, you also end up integrating somewhat in x, and that where you would expect to get the gain uh, in regularity. But observe that this is an equation that is entirely reversible in time. This will come again and again in, in what I'm doing, because whatever method um, I'm going to talk about, well, has to be compatible with that reversibility in time. Uh, in particular, nothing specific to the solution at some time t versus the solution at some time t equal to zero. So, it cannot be that you become smooth in rho at any positive time and you remain smooth, right? That's absolutely not the case. So here in particular, I am never saying that rho is infinity in time, h1 half in x, right? That wouldn't be possible. This is the kind of regularization that you would expect from a heat kernel, right? You start with something that is um, not smooth, and immediately, as, as t uh, is strictly positive, you have a smooth solution, and you keep a smooth solution for all times after that. Um, but the heat kernel is irreversible, right? You can go from t equal 1 uh, to the solution at t equals 0. That doesn't work. That's the reason why you have a smoothing effect. This, again, is a reversible equation, so it doesn't work like that. Uh, in particular, this kind of norm cannot be propagated, therefore, by the equation. Again, same reason. Uh, if it was propagated, well, if you're and then if you're in h one half at some later time, you would be in h one half at, at, at t equals zero. I choose the initial data, so cannot be. So again, what what you have here, even in, in this relatively simple version, is a much more subtle type of, of uh, uh, regularizing effect than what you have with, with a heat kernel, right? This sort of, of sub-manifold where uh, rho phi, uh, phi, where rho phi is in H1 half, right, is not stable by the equation. Uh, it's attractive in a sense that for most time, you're going to be on that uh, manifold, but you're not going to stay on it ever. So that's what averaging lemmas are, are about. Now, this is the, um, the very simple L2 case. 
And how, how is this done typically in L2? Well, you can use Fourier transform. So yeah, so, so I'm using a Fourier transform, but I'm using a Fourier transform in only in T and X, okay. So which uh, I'm going to keep F hat and G hat for the full Fourier transform uh, in actually X and D, which is why I'm, I'm having different notations. And if you do that, then the equation finds a very, very simple um, expression. So if I'm calling uh, uh, tau and pi, right, the, the uh, dual uh, variable, for t and x, uh, then I have completely diagonalized the, the equation, of course, uh, using, that, using that transform. So I can solve, right? And, and therefore, the whole question now is how in L2, this kernel 1 over tau plus v dot psi uh, is expressed. And, and what you can see is that for most v, most psi, well, v is not orthogonal to psi, so you will gain something when psi is very, very large. And that's the idea. Uh, now, at some points, of course, V and Xi can be orthogonal, and you can have uh, tau plus V uh, dot Xi, which is equal to zero. So what you do is you do a sort of interpolation. If this is big enough, right, you can use the formula. And for the point where this vanishes, well, you know that F is in L2. So there are various ways of, 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 of doing that. You can actually just integrate directly, use Cauchy-Schwarz and, and, and stuff like that as the expression. So it's not very complicated. It requires a, just a tiny bit of calculations here. All right, uh, but what happens in LP or in other settings? And so this was, uh, sorry, there's a nickel here. I'm not sure where it's coming from. If um, in the LP case, this was done by Dipierna, Lyons, and Meyer, mostly, uh, plus uh, uh, additional result by Bezard, and, and, and later on, Bushu has a very nice, um, simple method um, as well. Um, so the canonical example here is again uh, this.
So, uh, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. The, the, sorry, the echo just went away and I was okay. afraid I, I had a lot. I had the sound as well. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. So, so, so this is the the, um, uh, the, the, the typical uh, deep air alliance uh, type of setting, and. Uh, you're, uh, you are taking um, F in LP. Again, every variable. I, I'm not going to repeat log uh, along all the talk. That will be painful fast, but um, it's there, right? And, and in that case, uh, you get some sort of regularity. On row, um, for some positive S and some R that is uh, the result of an interpolation between P and Q. Um, so, depending whether P is uh, less than Q or Q is, is larger than P, you have something like this. All right, I'm not going to go into the details of how this is done, and I'm not even giving, going to give you the formula for S. Um, it's not that it's so hard, but uh, again, I'm trying to avoid going into um, unnecessary technical points. Um, it's, again, the same idea in the sense that you have to do a, a, an interpolation between the formula given by the Fourier transform and, and the basic estimate on F and G, depending on what is the best. And you have various ways of doing this kind of, of, uh, of interpolation. Um, the key point here is S is strictly positive. And only if well, you need to take less than a full derivative in X in the right hand side, right? Now, that's fairly obvious because you have one full derivative in X in the left hand side. So if I could take theta equal one, then then uh, this formulation of the equation would essentially be empty. I could just take any function and write it like that. Uh, so you need that. It's a little bit less obvious is you also need to be out of the um, L1 case. Uh, so if P is equal to one, then uh, you're not getting anything. The other relatively uh, important point here, and that is uh, quite of use when, when you're looking at the method, is the only case when you can get one half of derivative is if you are in L2. And of course, both exponents are, are, are both number of derivatives are zero. Um, now, this again just comes from the method, right? Because if you're going to do interpolation between LP and L2, well, the best case scenario is necessarily going to be L2, and this is it. Um, so out of this uh, basic result, you have uh, Quite a few examples where, where this has been used. And again, I'm just going to, to give the, uh, the main, um, uh, some of the main results here. Uh, 
So two big uh, examples. The first one was actually the uh, existence of weak solutions the Vlas of Maxwell system. Uh, by Dipern and Lyons. And the other one was, of course, the renormalized solution to Boltzmann. Now, and in the case of either system, what you have are nice uniform bounds on a certain number of quantities, but those are nonlinear equations. And you need at some point to have compactness to pass into the limit. So bounds are not enough. And you get that compactness out of averaging lemmas. And the reason is it's enough is because the, uh, for instance, glass of Maxwell, right? The interaction uh, depends on macroscopic quantities like the density or uh, the, the velocity flux. And those are going to be compact because they are integral in V of some averages of F. So averaging lemmas prove uh, very, very critical. Now, the case of the Boltzmann equation is, uh, is of course interesting because I said you didn't get anything if you were in L1 and well, with Boltzmann, you almost only have L1 on, on the solution F. Uh, well, actually, you have a little bit more because the entropy will give you L log L, and this amount of equi-integrability is enough to give you compactness, and, and there's an extension from that by, by uh, Gauss and Saint-Raymond. Um, where F is equi-integrable. In V, also, you don't even need F log F in V and X if you want. You only need equi-integrability in V. Uh, so that's very much the basic theory. Uh, there's been a lot of, of other results here uh, along the year, but again, I, I'm not going to uh, to cite as as, uh, as as they deserve it. Uh, in particular, has been um, uh, many things that that uh, we are done to to understand much better uh, the connection with uh, also um, hypoelliptricity, and, and there's a lot of work by. Uh, Arsenio and, and Saint-Raymond uh, in particular, and Arsenio and Masmoudi. And, and before that, we had some, some result uh, by, with, um, with Pertam and, and then with Vega about another, an, an, another way of doing the interpolation that was leading to other type of, of, uh, of regularity. So I will uh, skip most of it. Um, this again gives you the, the sort of basic uh, framework for averaging lemma uh, that uh, we are going to, to, to compare our result to. Now, um, so one application that I haven't talked about was kinetic formulations. And this is an interesting case because uh, in the two examples above, Boltzmann and Vlasov Maxwell, I don't really care how much regularity is gained. I only care that something is gained. But uh, for scalar conservations, you know, um, we do care. That's actually one of the main points. So what, what is this about? Um, the uh, scalar conservation law is, uh, you know, uh, converse, uh, a conservation law on a scalar, right? So it's a very simple toy model for a basic hyperbolic system. 
uh, when you're solving from some u, uh, right? So from r plus cross r d in r. That solves an equation like that. So where A is a flux, right? So it's a function from R to D. So of course, the big example is uh, the Berger's equation in, in 1D. that everyone knows very well. And in, in 1D, uh, and for convex fluxes, right, uh, there's a whole theory of regularization that actually dates back to the 50s by Olenik. So, U becomes PV, bounded variation in X, right? Uh, for all positive T, and this is, uh, well, again, there's a huge literature, but the, the, the big starting point uh, was the result by Oledic. Uh, so this uh, gave a strong suspicion that you had such a regularization effect also in, in a higher dimension. Um, but this had, had remained very, very much unclear. And one of the uh, big uh, breakthroughs there was the basic formulation introduced by Lyon, Pertam, and Tanmore in the 90s. And so what they do is the, they introduce um, a velocity variable, V, that is now going to be in, in R. Right? And And they define the following object, right? So if, if you are strictly positive, you take the matrix function of V is less than U. And if U is strictly negative, you uh, go the other way around. Now, this indicatrix function uh, has a very nice interpretation because if you take its derivative in velocity, what you get is something that is pretty much a young measure associated with, uh, with you. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but the advantage here of taking so the antiderivative of the young measure is for the scalar conservation law, there is a very, very neat algebra. And if U is a smooth solution, then you get a free transport equation on F uh, with a small a, which is the, the derivative of the, of the flux. So that's already a very remarkable fact. Uh, it's not a very big surprise because that's another way of uh, interpreting the, uh, the method of characteristics for scalar conservation laws. And, and what you can see is uh, con um, characteristics in that case are lines. So you end up with free transport. Um, what is very, very interesting is that this 
it will start being true as, as soon as there is a shock, of course, because you cannot apply the method of characteristic. But still have an equation then. And U is an entropy solution if and only if Now you solve the same kinetic equation, but with the right hand side, and the constraint on the right hand side, it, it has to be a non-negative measure. And the sign of M exactly corresponds to the inequality in the entropy condition uh, three. Um, so this is a very, uh, a, a very nice and, and I might add lucky uh, reinterpretation of the scalar conservation law. Uh, lucky because if you go to more complicated hyperbolic system, of course you won't be keeping that. Uh, although there are still some examples of kinetic formulations for other type of systems. Leon uh, Spertan and, and, and Tan Moore did that for the um, isentropic gas dynamics in, in, in 1D. The, the, uh, the gamma equal three uh, case, uh, and we did that with Pertam with uh, some models for uh, micromagnetic uh, films. So, so you have other examples of, of kinetic formulations like this. Um, but still, this will not apply to any conservation law. Now, uh, there's a lot that you can do with this kinetic formulation, and in a sense, you can uh, recover the whole uh, Khrushchev theory of, of uh, well posedness for uh, entropy solution. And I'm going to refer to Benoit here, uh, who had a paper on uniqueness and actually wrote a book on kinetic formulations that, that is very nice and that you can have a look at. Um, all right, the, the, the big point here, however, from my talk is uh, this is a kinetic equation. And because this is a kinetic equation, I can use averaging lemma. So I'm going to assume for simplicity that, that U is positive and, and U is, uh, is bounded, right, in L infinity. Um, because then F is compactly supported, this makes things a little bit simpler. So that's not strictly necessary, but, but you lose a little bit uh, otherwise. Now, if I need to use averaging lemma, I need to make some sort of assumption on A. And I haven't talked about that yet because for classical kinetic equations, uh, very often A of V is equal to V, so uh, uh, it doesn't matter, but here it does, right? And for example, what you see is that if A is constant on some interval in V, then you're not going to get anything. Because then if U is compactly supported in that interval, this is uh, a transport equation with constant coefficient, you are not going to get anything by averaging. So we need to ask that uh, the original flux be non-linear in an appropriate sense. And, and let me write down what that means here. So the classical formulation in that case um, is to look at the size right. 
to measure the set in V such that Uh, the corresponding term that we got in the Fourier transform, uh, let me look some pairs in here, V, sorry. Is small. And to get the best regularity, you ask that this behaves like epsilon which would be true if A of V was equal to V. So this is a control on uh, what are the directions in A of V, right? Uh, because you see that if A of V was equal to V, again, this would be the uh, uh, equation uh, for a strip next to a hyperplane. And then in a case like that, what happens is that you gain uh, essentially uh, one third of derivatives. So it's actually in the best of. For some R that I'm not going to, to, to talk about too much. And Oh, this actually took some time, so um, initially you had uh, only um, WS3 uh, for all S strictly less than one third, and then this was uh, improved uh, one, one step after another, and the optimal uh, the optimal Bezoff was actually obtained not that long ago, and and again here I'm going to um, to refer to um, to Francois uh, uh, with Benoit and and, and Takis. So there's a lot of of contribution uh, in the meantime. Um, okay. So again, what is interesting here, it's a good test of uh, optimality for averaging lemmas because how much you regularize, well, this is exactly what you're looking for. Now, you'll know that we are far from BV, and even though I, I'm, I'm going to skip that, there's a whole question uh, as to how, how close we can go to BV or not. Uh, this regularity actually doesn't use uh, the entropy solution, so it doesn't use the sign on M, it only uses uh, that M is a measure. So you could ask how much this can be improved if F is, is more than a measure, has a sign, and this is still pretty much uh, an open question. All right, so that, that is the basic idea of this application to, um, to scalar conservation law. And now it is time to um, tell you the basic idea behind our method. Um, now, a, a fun fact is that a few months after we, we, uh, we finished that, uh, there was another paper by, by Arsenio and, and Lerner with the same type of ID. So I'll, I'll go a little bit more into the comparison in, in tomorrow in the next section when, when I start showing you where the results diverge. The basic idea here is actually common to both papers. So it's, I think, relatively natural. So let me take a very simple case here. Uh, 
Then I'm going to take f and some l and infinity of lp, and g is going to be in l1 of some lq um, with nice duality between uh, between the two. So they are equal to one. Uh, now, in fact, uh, less or equal to one is enough uh, because everything is done locally. Now, the idea of the method is to use the V grad X to build a commutator. And So what we're going to, to uh, try and do, right, is we're going to find some convolution kernel And we are going to calculate the following thing. Now, K is symmetric, so the calculating this is, is very, very uh, obvious. And if I'm using the, uh, the equation here, You see what I will get. I will get the following. So let me write everything. Very, very, very obvious. And now what, what, what do I want? Well, I, I want to bound all those terms. So, okay. You know, uh, again, let's assume that everything has compact support. So I don't have to worry about what happens at infinity. Um, what, what, uh, how can I bound the first term, right? Well, this is less than C, uh, you know, F in L infinity of time L2 of xv uh, square if k hat, right, which is the Fourier transform, now hat will always denote the Fourier transform in x and v. Uh, so if k hat is, is, is bounded, right, so then I have a clean uh, multiplier in L2. And, and what about this term? Well, this is going to be less than C, you know, F, again, L infinity in time LP, right, of XV, G, L1 in time LQ of XV, if K is a calderon zygmunt operator. What do I do with this commutator? Let me give you an example of formula for k. Right, now this v grad x k, which is the term that is going there, if I take the Fourier transform in both variables, get that. 
So, let me take k hat. Is that expression. This is very simple because it's the inner product of a risk transform in uh, X, which what is essentially a risk transform in V as well is just that I regularize a little bit near cycle zero to avoid problem when I'm, when I'm taking derivatives. And you have a very simple direct calculation that shows you that this is larger than the following expression. So what do I deduce out of all that? Well, I go back to this expression. This is actually a sub f norm of f and all the other terms are bounded. So what do I have? I have this f hat square. Right. So that's that's it. That that is the new method. And it does give you a gain of half a derivative again in uh in X, right? Because of the xi. But it has a very different type of expression. And it does not require G to be in L2. That's a very, very big point. Um, so I'm out of my time now, so I will stop here. Uh, we will go back to that tomorrow and, and I'll comment a lot about already what this means and the difference with the classical results. Uh, but again, what I emphasize here is that this exponent here in general can be much, much less than two. And you still get one half of the derivative. Right. Sorry, I'm minutes above my time. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'm stopping here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre Manuel. We, we still have a few minutes for questions or comments. Would you like to ask question? Let's see if we have maybe among the participants. Uh, let me bring and back the webcam. Question. What about K? What are the hypotheses on K? You said that the function appearing in the convolution is a Calderon Sigmund. Yeah, so so no. Uh, so so you see that in the end here I'm I'm taking that particular K, all right, for this purpose. Yeah. Uh, and now I can check that, that it works, right? So it's bounded in L infinity, k hat, obviously. And, and this propagates, uh, so, so this is a good uh, uh, calderon zingmund kernel because it's the inner product of two calderon zingmund kernel, right? One in X and one in V. Mm -hmm. So it preserves the uh, LP bound in, in X and in V, no problem. So what I need out of K, uh, in other words, if I go back to my original equation, I need the middle term here to get me some gain in regularity. 
and I need the other terms to be bounded. And the other terms don't have derivatives. So, so if k is nice with respect to uh, LP spaces, then I'm, I'm good. 